I'm Mac the leader. All the gang. This guy used to be an NBA star. But he lost everything. Another player took his boat for a night out and was never seen again. Yeah, these are the craziest stories in NBA history. And first, we gotta talk about the time that an entire NBA team almost died in a plane crash. See, in 2021, the Utah Jazz were on a private jet flying to Memphis when all of a sudden, an explosion went off, causing the entire plane to shake and leaving players terrified. We just heard a, a boom, you know, the whole plane shook. You know, I feel like something had just like exploded in the back of the plane. You know, we, I immediately got the text in my mom and sister, and my, my dad just kind of saying like, like, yo, this this could be it. Something was really wrong with the plane. It felt like the plane was like breaking apart in midair. So people in the back of the plane said they saw flames and, you know, people in the front obviously didn't know what was going on. And everybody came to the point where it was like, man, this might be, this might be over for us. The entire jazz team was convinced they were gonna die. Now, thankfully, Pilot was able to pull off an emergency landing, but players were left wondering, what the hell happened up there? So after an investigation, it was discovered that a bird had flown directly into one of the engines, causing it to explode and sending the plane into a free fall. Damn, these guys were lucky to make it out alive. That's crazy. But what's even crazier is DeMar's story, because he once came face to face with a crazy person who broke into his home. In 2020, DeMar was chilling in his $15 million crib in LA, and it was just another night. His kids were playing upstairs while he was in the basement getting tatted up. When out of nowhere, the lights went out and the sound of screams echoed throughout the house. So I'm finished getting tatted. Probably like 10 minutes later, I hear my daughter scream. So I stop, I run upstairs, dude running down the other stairs. So I'm going after him. He go back out through the door, running, taking off. So at this point, once he get outside, I'm I'm like, damn, I can catch him, but I ain't gonna catch him <laughs> no. because I don't know if it's somebody else in the house. Mm -hmm. Left my kids in the house, so I'll go back in the house. It was crazy because dude hit the circuit box. That's why the lights would off in the house. Wow. If he would have finished my tattoo two minutes earlier, you know what I mean? I would have I would have had him. Jesus, who knows what that freak had planned? But thankfully, DeMar chased the guy out of his house and he was caught just an hour later. Man. Mars lucky things didn't go sideways, because some people's stories go completely off the deep end. Like, uh, there's an NBA player who was lost at sea and never seen again. This is former Pistons center Brian Williams, aka Bison Dele, who in the 90s played eight seasons in the NBA, made 45 million, and even won a championship with Michael Jordan. Uh, this guy had it all. But in 1999, Bison shocked everyone announcing his retirement from the NBA to pursue his true passion, traveling the world. So he went out and bought himself a boat, named it the Hakuna Matata, and spent the next three years sailing the Pacific Ocean. But on July 6th, 2002, Bison's dream turned into a nightmare, because with his brother Miles and girlfriend Serena, Bison set sail from the port of Tahiti and went missing. One week went to another week, and to another week, I started to call the boat frantically all the time. I called the, the Coast Guard. They went out looking. They didn't find any boats adrift. Uh, so nothing was found. Bison Dele, Miles DeBoer, and Serena Carlin were all officially lost at sea. So the FBI launched a full-scale investigation into their disappearance, hoping to find some clues for their whereabouts. Until eventually, something suspicious happened. Just a month into the search, Fetz discovered that someone claiming to be Bison had just written a $150,000 check in Bison's name. And after conducting a secret sting operation, they found out that the suspect was none other than Bison's own brother, Miles DeBoard. The same Miles that was supposed to be missing, making him the prime suspect for their disappearance. So the FBI issued a warrant for Miles' arrest expecting to get justice for Bison, only for the clock to run out, because in September of 2002, police finally caught up with Miles on a beach in Tijuana, Mexico. Problem was, they found him in a drug-induced coma, and shortly after, he was pronounced dead. Just like that, the case was officially closed, 
So what really happened to Bison Dele remains an unsolved mystery to this day. Damn, that's just wild. But you know it's not a mystery at all. The fact that Dennis Rodman's stories are crazy as hell. Because he was once offered 20 million to get a celebrity pregnant. See, in the early 90s, Rodman transformed himself into one of the hottest stars in the NBA. Wearing all kinds of crazy outfits, dyeing his hair weird colors. And this guy was different inside and out. And eventually, Dennis's style caught the eye of one of the most famous women in the world. Madonna, who was so obsessed with Rodman that she spent weeks calling the Spurs just to try and get in touch with him. Yeah, I think Madonna wanted that Rod, man. And in 1994, they finally decided to link up, holding hands in public, going on dinner dates, and even going belt shopping together. But just a couple of months later, Rodman's relationship took an interesting turn. Because one night, he was out gambling in Vegas when he got a call from Madonna who had a crazy proposal. Well, you know, <laughs> she asked me that if I got her pregnant, she'll pay me $20 million. What? Yeah, she was offering $20 million for a mini Rodman. And Dennis was down, so he hopped on the first flight out of Vegas and flew all the way to New York just to hook up with Madonna. But in the end, he lined up to shoot and shot blanks, leaving Madonna without a baby and missing out on $20 million. Damn, I can't believe it. And uh, I can't believe Joel Embiid either, because he told one of the craziest stories in NBA history, and it was all one big lie. See, there's one thing about Embiid's childhood that he's been telling everyone. It's that when he was growing up in Cameroon, the boys in his village had to prove they were men by going into the jungle and killing a lion. So according to Joel, when he was just six years old, he marched into the jungle and slayed a beast. Kansas, they call me the lion killer. Have you actually killed a lion, Joel? Yeah, when I was about six years old, uh, you know, I had to go in the jungle to uh, kill the lions. Uh, I had a spear and I threw it and uh, threw it out a lion and he fell asleep and then I just came and killed them. Um, and then I carried the lion on my back, back to the village and uh, carried it. And when I got to the village, I was just, I pulled out that I was a man and I, beca I became a man since I was six years old. But in 2016, Joel made a little confession about this lion story. Because in an interview with Adrian Wojnarowski, Joel revealed that after all these years of calling himself the lion killer, he made the whole story up just to troll people. Is your childhood different than people here seem to imagine? Oh uh, yeah, Americans, they don't really have any idea of what's going on in the world. I kind of use that to my advantage too. Like, you, you gonna tell someone I killed a lion, they're gonna be afraid of you. And they're not gonna come at you. So that was a way for me to like, make them be scared of me. Damn, this man was lying about lions. That's ridiculous. But look, not every story is a laughing matter. Because Delonte West went from being an NBA star to a homeless man on the side of the street. See, Delonte grew up in the hoods of DC and was constantly bullied. So to keep his mind busy, he kept focused on basketball, practicing day and night, until eventually he accomplished his dreams of joining the NBA. And with the millions rolling in, Delonte saw the perfect opportunity to take his family out of poverty. Find them all nice cars, big houses, and making sure to treat himself too. But in 2011, everything went south. Because Delonte had spent so much money that, during the NBA lockout, he had to get a job at Home Depot just to pay his bills, working minimum wage as an NBA player. And things got even worse for Delonte, because behind the scenes, he was dealing with serious mental health issues, lashing out at teammates, coaches, the man was battling demons to the point where, in 2012, it officially cost him a spot in the league, getting released by the Dallas Mavericks. And while ultimately, this would be the last time we saw Delonte on an NBA court, that was the least of his problems. Because over the next few years, with no basketball and no money coming in, Delonte fell victim to hard drugs, pushing his family away in the process. And with nowhere else to turn, Delonte West officially went homeless. I don't give a Okay. Young champ, I'm the leader of the bucket. Goddamn Navy Seals, and the home, and the Navy. I'm what where's the Trump? I'm the real president. My dog, the lion thing. How you doing, my brother? Oh, you ain't got two dogs? Man.
Delante was at rock bottom, and his life's been up and down ever since. Man, I feel bad for Delante. His story's tragic. But LeBron's story is scandalous, because what happened to him sparked a nationwide cover-up. In 2009, LeBron was hosting a basketball camp run by Nike, and during a scrimmage, he was dominating, putting on a show for all the kids. But out of nowhere, something scandalous happened. Jordan Crawford, a sophomore guard at Xavier, going up and over LeBron James with a vicious two-hand slam. You'll never see it because Nike confiscated the only two videotapes that captured it. Yeah, apparently, LeBron got dunked on by one of the kids, Jordan Crawford. But all the footage of the dunk was immediately confiscated because Nike thought that if the public saw the clip, it would ruin LeBron's reputation. And uh, they also thought this cover-up was gonna work. But in the end, it was hopeless, because just a few weeks later, the folks over at TMZ managed to find the only remaining copy of the dunk, leaking the footage to the entire world. Damn, I don't even blame Nike now. LeBron got sh** on. I see why they try to hide this story, but John ja Morant's story is one that everyone should know. Because what if I told you that he only made it to the NBA because a bag of Doritos? See, Ja had a chip on his shoulder since day one. Because in high school, he was the underdog. It was just five foot nine, getting bodied by bigger players every night. And as a result, scouts overlooked Ja, figuring he was too small and would never make it to the NBA. So by his junior year of high school, Ja still hadn't received a single Division I offer. It was looking like his NBA dreams were dead. But in 2016, Ja's world got flipped around. While he was attending a basketball camp in South Carolina, hoping to finally impress college scouts, he caught the eye of one spectator that changed his life. I got added to the camp late. It was like, if I don't call your name, then go to the other gym. My name wasn't called, so I went to the back gym. James Kane from Murray State University was there recruiting another player in the main gym when he got hungry. He was directed down a hallway to a concession stand. I ordered some Doritos and, and a soda. I was able to hear the balls bouncing in the auxiliary gym. <laughs> Ended up peeking his head in the gym and was watching for a couple minutes. Um, I guess that's when he seen me. Just a few minutes of watching Ja, you just knew he was special. I called my boss right away and said, you got to come up here and see this kid. We immediately got to, to Spartanburg the next day, and I was just blown away uh, by his total gain. And the very next day, Ja received his first official D1 scholarship to Murray State, going on to become the player that we know and love today, all because a recruiter wanted some Doritos. Damn, it's not your average story right there. And neither is Chris Bosch's. Because what happened to him not only cost him his NBA career, it nearly cost him his life. Back in 2015, Bosch was playing in his 10th All-Star game, when all of a sudden, the entire left side of his body went numb, and it got harder and harder to breathe. So after the game, Bosch checked himself into a local hospital, where the doctors found something crazy. I got a CT scan at the hospital. I called my wife and let her know what was going on. They informed me that my oxygen levels were dangerously low. That's when they told me that the next 24 hours would be cr critical. Chris had developed a blood clot in his leg that had traveled all the way to his lungs. And if he didn't get this under control immediately, he would suffocate from the blood and die, leaving doctors with no choice but to undergo emergency surgery. They prepped me, put me under, and I woke up and I had uh, two uh, tubes coming out of my uh, my ribs into a drainage. You just kind of think like, man, is this gonna be my life? Is this, is, is this what it has come to? I wasn't even thinking about basketball at that time. I was happy to be alive. I was happy just to have the smallest things. Now luckily, Chris's surgery was a success, but this was only the beginning, because in 2019, after three years of trying to make an NBA comeback, the blood clots kept happening giving him no other choice but to walk away from basketball forever. But look, unlike Chris, there's some players that are asking to die. Because Dennis Rodman once became best friends with the most dangerous man on the planet. See, in 2013, Rodman got invited to host a basketball camp in one of the most dangerous places on Earth, North Korea. 
And Ramen said, screw it, why not? So he jumped on a private jet and flew to Pyongyang, where he met with one of the most ruthless men in the world, North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. Like, this guy puts people in prison just for having the wrong haircut, okay? He's a dangerous man. And while one mistake could have been Ramen's last, instead, he hung out with Kim and hit it off, playing basketball, going skiing, and even flying to Kim's private island together. They party with North Korean women all night long. When you were in North Korea, he has an island that you compared to like a Ibiza or something, yeah. and does he have loaded chicks there? No, but wait this, he has, a, he has an all-girl band. An all-girl band? It's how many people, like 16, 17 girls? Yeah. When you get invited to this island, you get your own bedroom, you get your own setup, right? Right. And what goes on there? There's 17 girls who are in this band, they just play music for him when he wants to hear music. Like, instead they, of putting they, on a radio... They follow him everywhere on, on the world. Yeah. They follow him everywhere. That's, that's what they do. By the end of Ramen's trip, his life had changed forever. Because he had just become best friends with Kim Jong-un, even visiting him five more times over the next few years. Damn, this man Dennis really left Madonna. For this guy? I think this might be a rare L for Mr. Ramen. But Nike took an even fatter L. Because they once did Steph Curry so dirty... It cost him billions. Back in 2009, Steph signed his very first shoe deal with Nike, worth 10 million. And over the next few years, business was real good. So in 2013, with his contract about to expire, Steph went to Nike headquarters, expecting the deal of a lifetime. But what he got instead was disrespect. Because throughout the entire meeting, every Nike rep in the room was calling him the wrong name. They were calling Steph Curry, Stephon. Who the hell is Stephon? And they did Steph even dirty, as they also forced him to sit through an entire hour-long presentation that was literally designed for Kevin Durant. Yeah, they were too lazy to make Steph his own presentation. So with that, Steph walked out the building pissed, refusing to sign another deal with Nike. And just a few days later, Steph found a new shoe deal, coming in the face of Under Armour, making them billions. Man, Nike just blew it. But all right, dog. We've heard a lot of crazy stories so far, and yet we've got one that tops them all. The craziest life story in NBA history. Meet Manute Bull, the tallest player the league has ever seen. And back in the 60s, he was born in one of the poorest countries in the world, Sudan, where every day was a struggle just to survive. From diseases to starvation, and most importantly, a deadly civil war that was destroying the entire country killing hundreds of his friends and family. This war lit a fire in young Manute, so growing up, he promised to one day find a way out. And luckily, he had one gift that would make that possible, his size. Because by the time Manute was 17, the kid was already standing at a ridiculous seven foot seven. So with that, he started playing basketball with dreams of making it to the NBA. And when word started spreading around about the giant from Sudan, Scouts started lining up to try and recruit Manute, until eventually, in 1985, he got his big break, being drafted by the Washington Bullets and making history as the tallest NBA player ever. This changed Manute's life forever, because over the next decade, he became one of the most popular players of all time, playing 10 years in the league and earning over $7 million. But despite all the success, Manute never lost sight of the real reason he played basketball, his country. So when he wasn't playing in the NBA, he was back home in Sudan, doing everything he could to save his people. From building schools, to feeding the hungry, providing medicine, even organizing peaceful protests throughout Sudan. By the end of his life, Manu had spent every dime he made in the NBA, giving back to his country. And while in 2010, he tragically passed away, his legacy will live on forever. Because just seven months later, South Sudan officially declared its independence for the first time ever. And to celebrate, every year on July 9th, they all pay respect to the man who helped lead the way, the seven foot seven giant, Manu Bull. Damn, now that's crazy. Well look, it's not just the NBA, cause the NFL has had some crazy moments too. From a stadium's roof collapsing, to fans skydiving into an arena. It's ridiculous what they got going on over there. Look, if you wanna hear more, then you need to click on this video right here. These are the 20 craziest moments in NFL history. And trust me, man, this video's a banger, all right? You're missing out if you haven't seen it. So what are you doing? Click it.